our journey through the invention of photography. But before we get there to understand what this dream is about, we need to return all the way down to the Middle Ages. So we're back to the fifth century and we're thinking about painting because painting was always essentially part of an important dream. What has painting done for us over time? It has done plenty of things. It has helped us to still time. It has helped us to preserve beauty. It has helped us to represent what fades and what is difficult to pin down and grasp. Think about a world in which images are very rare. That was the Middle Ages. Images were mostly available in churches and they looked like fantastical apparitions, like holographic apparitions. They were magical, truly magical, but especially during the, Mid the Middle Ages, as you can see, realism is not the essential element of painting. This work by Masaccio, which happens to be made at the very beginning of the Renaissance, is already showing a little more realism than the previous works I showed you. When you compare it right next to the Madonna by Cimabue, with the same uh, subject, the Madonna and throne, you can see how drastically the representation has changed only in a few hundred years. And what I wanted to do is to trace this history of this dream of preserving beauty, still in time, until it takes us up to the invention of photography. The Middle Ages is a place of narrative. Painting is a tool through which stories can be told and understood by those who cannot read. Proportions and perspective are arbitrary. Realism is not the essential tool through which to represent the world because clarity governs the real essence of painting. The image has to be clearly readable from a narrative standpoint. That's what really matters. And we see that over and over and over in this beautiful medieval works that lead up to the beginning of the Renaissance. Giotto is considered already to be a threshold between the tradition of flat and synthetic representation of the Middle Ages and what will come next with the Renaissance. But between um, the flatness and the spirituality, the divine representation of the Middle Ages and the realism of the Renaissance, there's the Black Death. The Black Death was the changing agent of the world, and it was a pandemic. I think, you know, we can all rejoice in the knowledge that um, COVID-19 wasn't quite the Black Death, because considering how we handled it, we'd probably all be dead. Now that I've cheered you up, um, the Black Death changed Europe and really brought the Middle Ages to an end. How? By killing 25 million people in Europe alone over a few period of time, only roughly five years. Those who survived the uh, Black Death found themselves surrounded by relative wealth, by a completely different economic setup that enabled the emergence of the uh, new upper classes, the new aristocratic classes of the Renaissance. And the emergence of art, the development of art through the Renaissance is linked to this economic well-being and to humanism. Think about making it through something as tragic as the Black Death and surviving it. From an existentialist perspective, many questions needed to be answered. Why did it happen? What did we do, God, to deserve this? And what do we do now with the knowledge we have acquired through that experience? So humanism is the return, the rediscovery, the principle of a philosophical root that in Italy belongs to Greece. It's the connection between classical Greece and what the Italian Renaissance will become, the Renaissance, the rebirth of classical knowledge. Through humanism, we find the reprise of realism. This is the dream. 
Realism is extremely important in Western art, but I always care to say that it's not a Western art invention. One of my favorite works of art of all times is this beautiful Chinese scroll by Huang Quan, who well before we get to the Italian Renaissance, we're looking at uh, 400 years roughly before the Italian Renaissance, painted these beautiful birds and insects and turtles in the uttermost delicate realism. Look, he even placed these birds in perspective, as you can see here, because the purpose of this work was to teach his son how to paint animals in, and how to study them and to see them from different angles. So that's to say that when other cultures have a purpose to employ realism, they can do it too. Like, for instance, in this case, with this beautiful uh, bronze head of Eif that predates the Italian Renaissance by roughly 200 years, which, again, displays this extremely beautiful um, kind of realism. And these heads were made in contemporary Nigeria and cast in bronze in a way that were um, absolutely complex and refined. So, realism during the Renaissance as you know, this is what's happening uh, at the same time as we see the, the heads of Eif and um, the, the work by Wang Quan, is the accomplishment in the West of the revival of Greek classical art, which, so that we're all on the same page, looks like this. Our beautiful marbles, classical sculptures in which um, beauty and nakedness symbolize the dignity and moral value of the human mind. How else would you display the ethical values and the moral values of the human by mind if not through the healthy and um, well-proportioned body? So this connection between classical Greece and the Renaissance establishes realism as the only language that can be spoken through painting throughout the history of Western art. And perspective, central perspective, which was um, theorized by Alberti, becomes the best friend of realism, as you can see here. You could not paint in any other way at the time, but in a realistic style. And this realism is designed to center the human, is designed to place us in a privileged position and in a position of intimacy with the representation. While medieval representations aimed to separate the divine from the materiality of the living, Renaissance painting is a window onto the world. And you can see here how Leonardo really exploits this idea with this beautiful aerial perspective we see at the back of um, Santana and the Madonna. But Leonardo knew a thing or two, a secret that is at the root of the history of photography. He knew about optical devices that could be used in order to shortcut around painting. Well, this is one of the representations we find in the Codice Atlantico, you know, like Leonardo's notebooks. And it is not clear if Leonardo himself used these optical devices in order to bypass challenges involving copying nature in order to summon the uttermost realism in his work, or whether he just speculated around these devices. But we know something for sure, that Italian artists and some Northern European artists used this tool in order to make their work, their paintings, the Camera Obscura. The Camera Obscura is the grandmother of the photographic camera. And it has a very long history that unfortunately fizzles out into the origin of things as it is with the most exciting of inventions. Uh, it is claimed that a Chinese philosopher, Mo Ti, uh, mentions the camera obscura at around 2,500 um, 2, years ago, and that he talks about it as a tool that it's capable 
of collecting places. How does the camera obscura work? First of all, it is a contained space, as you can see here in this image. This is another reference point in the history of the invention of the camera obscura. Halazen bin al Haytham uh, was a mathematician who had already played in enclosed spaces through which, through a hole, light could filter through and cast a projection into the space. This is the principle of the camera obscura. You can see this diagram here. This is the box, camera, obscura, dark room. And an object placed right outside it, this is the hole, the pinhole through which light is allowed to travel through, casts a projection of the object outside the box inside it. It is upside down because that's how the uh, light travels through the hole. But nonetheless, it is neat, it is clear, and it is effective. So it doesn't take long for Renaissance artists to harness this incredible invention, and as you can see here, to um, use it, to copy their, the outside, the uh, subject, and trace it onto a canvas or a piece of paper. There were different models of camera obscura that you could use and uh, build for yourself. Some quite complex with different lenses and mirrors that could project the image onto your canvas or sheet of paper exactly at the size you needed it. Now the camera obscura becomes a bit of a bone of contention and actually as I say a bit of a bone of contention I feel like I'm, I'm delivering an understatement here. People argue about this really like argue because um, there's an implication that artists who uh, didn't use the, that used the camera obscura cheated and that their ability to structure space as we see here in this beautiful painting by Van Eyck, which was most likely made with a camera obscura, is a little bit less, you know, the talent is a little bit less. However, you have to remember that the camera obscura does not paint the image for you. It certainly facilitates the representation of space, details, and perspective. But you still have to apply the color afterwards. And you can see here an incredible level of mastery in these works. The ambassadors by Holbein may have also been created with the use of the camera obscura because of the intricacy that we see here in the uh, marble floor and the amount of detail. This is realism at its best. This is the dream of Western uh, art at this very point, to accentuate realism as much as possible, to create a vivid illusion of life. Then we get to Caravaggio. Now, Caravaggio has been at the center of a lot of controversy when it comes to the use of the camera obscura. Um, the, some restorators have x-rayed many works by Caravaggio and we know for sure that Caravaggio didn't draw. So there are no preparatory sketches or drawings with graphite or charcoal underneath the layers of paint, which is pretty much outstanding when you think about the beauty of these works. So that's where the speculation begins. How could he? Was he just going straight onto the canvas with paint? Or was he using other uh, devices in order to trace the image onto the canvas? And there's an interesting scholar, Italian scholar, called Roberta Lapucci, who's a uh, Caravaggio specialist, who's written a lot about Caravaggio, that claims that Caravaggio used the camera obscura and that he actually used crushed fireflies powder in order to um, outline the uh, figures and objects on the canvas and then applied uh, oil color on top. These theories are very much disputed and they cause a lot of controversy. Some of you may have come across a book by David Hockney, uh, the artist David Hockney, who was particularly fascinated by the idea that many Western artists use the camera obscura to make their work and you know, set off to theorize who may have used it and how. If you're interested, the book is called Secret Knowledge and it's really fascinating. There's also a documentary I think you can still find on YouTube with David Hockney argumenting his thesis. Uh, Vermeer is another artist who comes under fire 
accused of using the camera obscura, although um, many, uh, many art historians disagree. Uh, most times, the use of the camera obscura is disproved on the ground of finding a hole at the center of the painting. If you find a tiny hole at the center of a painting like this, which happens a lot in Vermeer, it means that the artist has actually placed a pin in the middle and then used a thread attached to the pin to draw the um, converging lines for the perspective, uh, the depth uh, of, the, of the work. So in that case, what you find is a contradiction. If you are tracing the perspective using the camera obscura, then why should you also have the whole of a pin and, uh, you know, which emphasizes the use of a thread to trace uh, converging lines? I can see the, um, the argument there, but I can also see how this amount of detail and certain distortions that have been uh, linked to the distortions that are usually caused by a lens can make others assume that actually uh, Vermeer also used the camera obscura. So think about this, the camera obscura has been around, hopping around Europe a lot, right? Uh, different artists use it, they all keep it secret because they don't wanna get a bad reputation. But the camera obscura is also within the knowledge of physicists and engineers who like to play with optics. You know, those who researched optics as well were interested in the camera obscura and its applications. So the German Johann Henrik Schultz uh, experiments in the early 18th century with different materials and is close in a sense to laying the foundations of photography. However, that doesn't quite happen. He works with silver nitrate and silver nitrate is already, if you like, a foundational ingredient in what will become later on the modern photographic image. However, the big problem with the birth of photography is fixing images. So there are other um, inventors that we will see tonight who get close to inventing photography, but don't invent it because they cannot fix, preserve the image on the support they use to capture the image. Back to the camera obscura, meanwhile, and Italy. Our contribution to the history of photography is substantial, even if we have to admit it, the uh, invention of photography is mostly a French-British deal in the end. This is the camera obscura that was used by Canaletto. You will remember Canaletto and the beautiful vistas of Venice he created. These are incredible images he made using the camera obscura. There is a lot of controversy here too. Uh, which of the paintings have been made with the camera obscura and which have not? Um, why did Canaletto use a camera obscura? Well, you saw my slide claiming this is commercial art, and it is. Canaletto had a very sophisticated um, group of connoisseurs and uh, estimators who loved these paintings, and these happened to be British, French, German collectors who most often undertook the grand tour. The Grand Tour was the formative journey that all the wealthy and noblemen, especially um, from Northern Europe, would take at some point in their lives to get face to face with the classical culture that formed their education in other countries. So it was their opportunity to move theory from the pages of books to reality and visit Venice, Florence, Rome, Naples, sometimes travel all the way down to Sicily and eventually to Greece. It would take up to five years at times and it was inc an incredible, for incredibly formative opportunity. However, you can imagine that at a time in which photography wasn't invented and in which there were no souvenirs, which I know you would love to bring back souvenirs from Venice, they're so classy. Um, this is what Canaletto did. He provided his clientele with souvenirs. Beautiful, large canvases of Venice that could be shipped back home and wait for you to enjoy them upon your return. The Camera Obscura allowed Canaletto to copy the minutia of Venetian architecture quickly, effectively, and faithfully in a way that by hand could have become more complicated and too time consuming. This is the commercial implication. The more he could get these paintings 
done faster, the more money it would make, the more famous it would become. It became so famous in that moving to Britain, where it was very much loved. Look at these beautiful vistas. And once again, the camera obscura doesn't apply paint to your canvas. That's entirely down to you. But it can certainly help you with the representation of architecture, simplifying the process and streamlining the process so that you can paint faster, produce more works of art to sell. And at the same time, many historians have become interested in these works because they are faithful representations of what um, Venice looked like. We know that on and off he moved around a couple of buildings just to fit them in, but each building seems to be pretty faithful to what it was like at the time. So they are really interesting for historical documentation too. Now that we've been all become um, homesick for Venice, Thomas Wedgwood. Thomas Wedgwood is the other protagonist of the invention of photography. This is, um, he's a minor um, protagonist because unfortunately his photograms never fixed. And this is the tragedy of everyone who experimented with photographic uh, techniques, early photographic techniques. I'm gonna tell you more about how a photograph comes to life, but Wedgwood worked with what's pretty much this. This is a photogram, not a photograph. There's a difference between the two. A photogram is done without a camera. A photogram is done by laying an object onto the surface of the photographic plate, exposing the object to light, and then processing the photographic plate. The surface that's been exposed to light appears dark. The surface that was blocked by the presence of the object remains light, most often white, and therefore creates a silhouette. Uh, this is one by Henry Fox Talbot, who was one of the key inventors of photography. Unfortunately, Wedgwood never worked out how to fix his uh, photographs. So whenever he took them out into sunlight, they would just fade away and become black, which was a tragedy in so many ways. That's how we get to our 1826, very important date in the history of photography. When you flick through magazines, just general interest magazines, you will find that everyone says, oh, photography was invented in 1839, and it kind of grates on me because that's not true. Photography was invented in 1826. I'll tell you what happens in 1839 and why general interest magazines and newspapers just cut to the chase and say it was invented in 1839. The first photograph ever taken, and let's say the first photograph that didn't fade away, looked like this. And I know if you were holding your breath, you're not particularly impressed because it is very fuzzy, it is very difficult to see, but it's the work of Joseph Nietzsche for Nieps. And it's basically what he saw from outside his window. Now, there's one thing in photography that's really important and it's called exposure. Exposure is the amount of light you allow to come into the camera to impress your plate. At this time in the history of photography, film doesn't exist. So what you're thinking about is a box, which I'm going to show you uh, in a couple of slides. There's an image that might help us understand better what we're looking at, which is a gelatin silver print of this original plate made by Nieps, and it looks like this. This is not what Nieps created, but it's a rendition of the image that at least allows us to see some of the roofs, right, and understand what he rejoiced for when he realized that he actually captured reality like it ne had never been done before. This is the continuation of the dream that I was mentioning earlier, the idea of Getting rid of the artist, that's the dream, and accomplish realism in an objective way. This is the camera he used. And you can see that it's what many of you have discovered already in your lives as a pinhole camera. What's more sophisticated here is the aperture that you see here, made of blades that can be closed to allow more or less light into the box. The plate would be placed into the box from the back, and once you had one photograph, you had one photograph. You couldn't replicate it. There is no negative in the history of photography at this point. 
curiosity. What did bring Nieps to um, invent, well, to, to take the first photograph? Italy, ha <laughs> ha, you didn't expect that. He used to spend quite a bit of time in Sardinia and loved the landscape and tried and tried to draw it to his satisfaction and never succeeded. You find that the inventors of photography are all artists or wannabe artists who couldn't quite succeed in accomplishing what they wanted and dreamt of a mechanical tool that could help them capturing the beauty they saw. So you can really see this intimate connection between painting, drawing, and photography. 1839, the very important day. Well, Nieps is one of the first inventors of photography who dies uh, because of the fumes and toxicity of the materials that were being used uh, to make the first photographs. Uh, the first photograph by Nieps was made on a pewter plate that was covered in bitumen of Judea. Uh, there is a level of toxicity in many of these um, elements that affected him and also affected Louis Daguerre, who was the inventor of an other iteration of photography called the daguerreotype. Now, this is Louis Daguerre himself represented in a daguerreotype. This is a mission for you. When you get a chance to explore the world in person once again, put it on your bucket list. You have to see a daguerreotype in person because I cannot do it justice with this slide or even with this other slide of a cat. The daguerreotype is an incredible accomplishment. First of all, it's relatively small, it tends to be pocket size. And as you can see, it comes framed beautifully in these pockets, um, sort of uh, cases. They're cases made of different materials, sometimes uh, made of wood, sometimes made of metal, and they were meant to be portable. They were sort of keepsakes, often used for the representation and portraits of loved ones. They are copper plates, metal plates of different kinds, polished to a mirror finish that have been treated with different uh, com a complexity, really complex layering of different chemicals involving vapors of mercury. And what happens with the daguerreotype is that it looks like a mirror. And when you, when you just tilt it in your hands, it's like a portal that you can access. So it looks like a hologram. It's not a photograph in the contemporary conception of what, of what we see today when we look at a photograph. Find a way to get your hands on the daguerreotype and take a look at it. Last time I checked, we had some on the lower um, floor, uh, lower ground floor at the Art Institute um, in the photography galleries. So just see them there, absolutely stunning creation. So here it is, the first hipster ever photographed on a daguerreotype. Um, no surprise, everyone so, was so excited about the daguerreotype. Daguerre perfected the camera that Nieps had created, applying a lens, as you can see there, and he captured incredible details. Paris was ablaze with enthusiasm in 1839 when photography was gifted to the world. You know, the French were so kind and illuminated. Progress and technology were gifts to share. And they did share it with everyone but Britain. This is the twist in the history of photography that will lead to the invention of photography the way we know it, the modern kind of photography. But what happens in Italy, you're wondering? Well, good news. Despite the fact that photography is invented technically in France and it's launched in France, because of the connection that was long-standing between Paris and Milan, photography arrives in Milan almost at the same time as it is launched in, um, in Paris. And there's a lot of excitement in Milan about photography. The um, dissemination and popularization of photography in Milan is linked to uh, the Optico Duroni, who had an optics uh, optician shop 
in uh, the Galleria de Cristoforis next to the Duomo in Milan and held a demonstration. Here's our Alessandro Duroni. Uh, he held a demonstration on how to produce a daguerreotype. And I just wish and I hope you can imagine the magic surrounding this type of um, incredible event. Finally, the dream of capturing reality is here. You can use this device, a camera, expose reality to it, and reality is transferred onto a metal plate, and it looks exquisitely detailed. Alessandro Duroni will become uh, one of the earliest and most important photographers in Italy, but he, he also had a shop. Um, an optician's shop in Paris. So he imported all the materials needed for processing um, the daguerreotype from Paris directly. I wanted to show you his, uh, one of his few surviving daguerreotypes. And as you can see here is a, a beautiful funerary monument that was photographed. There is something about the daguerreotype and early photography that I have not mentioned to you, but that it's really important. We talked about exposure time. We talked about exposure, and I, I mentioned to you that that's the amount of time you allow light to filter through the camera. But I didn't tell you that the first photograph taken by Niepce required an exposure time of eight hours. Now, that's a long click, isn't it? It's a very long time for a surface a light sensitive surface to receive information. That's also why the image is so blurry because the sun shifts, let's say shadows shift across the sky and create blurry effects. For a very long time, photography was a matter of capturing static objects. The daguerreotype cuts the exposure times dramatically. But still, at the very beginning, it's difficult to capture people. If you went to a photographic studio during the 19th century, at the cusp of the invention of photography, like you know, in 1839 or more, most likely 1840, 1841, you would have been overwhelmed by the contraptions that a photographer had to put in place, a headrest and other uh, devices, a chair, that was specifically designed to keep you looking natural and yet still for sometimes a matter of 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Don't blink your eyes, otherwise you will look like you're possessed by the devil. There's so many complications about taking early photographs. So it's no coincidence that this first experiment, one of these earliest experiments by Duroni, is of sculptures, subjects that don't move. But not everyone in Italy was as lucky as Duroni um, to have a connection, a direct a connection with um, Paris. So uh, Enrico Federico Gest, the first photographer in Piedmont, actually recreated his own technology in Turin and took this image of Turin, which is the first photograph ever taken in that area. And as you can see again, it dates 1839. He is one of the most important pioneers in the history of Italian photography. But back to Duroni, who I said was one of the most prolific and earliest photographer. This is Piazza del Duomo in Milan. Isn't it astonishing? None of these buildings stand, and it becomes complicated to understand which way we are looking. The Duomo is clearly behind us or on the side. And you can see that photography becomes a great opportunity to document architecture, to document everyday life, and document reality. Now, there's another phenomenon that it's very specific to Italy that it's different from the rest of Europe. And we will explore that as I show you more images. But I have to tell you that Daguerre's fortune with the daguerreotype was limited. The daguerreotype was expensive still, and it was not reproducible. You still placed a metal plate inside your camera, exposed it to light, and it was a one-take deal. You could not reproduce the same image. 
let's go to Britain and see what happens. All the Brits are disappointed that the European continent is playing with photography, but they've been left out because the French and the Brits just don't like each other. And that gives somebody a great opportunity to reinvent photography all over again. So Henry Fox Talbot really had a rough night when he knew, when he was told that Daguerre launched photography in Paris. It's like, oh wow, that's what I was working on. He was working on that too, I didn't know. See the things that happen without the internet? It's not as easy as going on Google and just checking that somebody has not invented something that you wanted to invent already. So it really played in Talbot's favor that Britain was cut off from the photographic licensing. And Talbot reinvented photography. His type of photography was called calotype, the beautiful, impression. Now the beautiful impression had a very important quality. It wasn't quite as refined and detailed as the daguerreotype, but it was cheaper to make, it printed on paper, and it came with a negative. That meant commercial viability. It was the future of photography. Daguerre wasn't too disappointed because he was given a massive pension and a mansion to live in, he never had to work again. That was from, from France. But the daguerreotype by the 1860s is disappearing and it's replaced by the calotype. These are still daguerreotypes from Luigi Sacchi. Luigi Sacchi was another Italian pioneer. And you can see Milan again in this beautiful image. What I love about these images is the absence of cars. Isn't it amazing? If you're also asking yourselves, why is there no people? At what time were these images made? It was like these still required a quite extensive exposure at times. And well, there weren't quite as many people around in the streets as there are today, but people were not captured by early photography. So there is this strange eerie um, effect that just happens when you photograph a city. People, if they're walking, they move too fast for the photograph to capture their presence. So beautiful view of, uh, again, the Duomo in Milan, which hasn't changed one bit, but what is around it has changed dramatically. The piazza is not there, and you can see here these, these buildings that uh, occupy the space in which now the Galleria Vittorio Emanuele stands are instead present. I can't even imagine what it would have been like to open your windows and see something as beautiful as Milan's Duomo uh, just outside. And of course, Italy is all about architecture. It's all about history. It's all about ruins. So this is the essence, essential difference between the emergence of photography in France, the emergence of photography in Britain, the subjects that are essential to the birth of photography elsewhere, the portrait. That's what everyone cares about. But when it comes to Italy, the portrait is not the driving force through which uh, photography develops. Giacomo Caneva was another pioneer, early pioneer of Italian photography. And of course, we're shifting down to Rome. What's interesting about the beginning of uh, photography in Italy is that it starts in Milan, moves up to Turin, and then it trickles down to Venice, Florence, Naples, Rome, no, Rome, Naples. And it's really a, a national, if you like, um, uh, moment. You know, there, there's a sense of innovation that actually travels far. And this is where we, we encounter the first stumbling block with identity, the representation of landscape, and Italy. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Giacomo Caneva, as you can see, chooses subjects that are just essentially important to the history of Italy. You have to remember that when you photograph, for as objective as you try to be, one of the most important things the photographer does is to select. What you point at is already a work of art in the sense that it's an interpretation of the world. It's no longer the world as it is. What you leave outside defines what is inside. The way in which you capture what is inside also begins to tell a story that the world cannot quite tell. So Giacomo Caneva became a specialist in the representation of Rome and beautiful Roman monuments and ruins. 
This is where the national identity of Italy begins to be constructed through the photographic lens. And as you can tell, it's an identity based in the past, grounded in the past, grounded in architectural glories. But that's not necessarily a problem. This is why it's actually viable to argue that despite the fact that photography was invented in uh, Paris and then uh, further developed in Britain, Italy plays a very important role in the history of photography itself because everyone flocked to Italy to photograph it. It was where everyone wanted to be to experiment and to catalog. There's a frenzy where uh, photographers from Scotland arrive in Italy and want to have an opportunity to pioneer something unique that had never been seen before. So this place, which I hope you can visit when um, traveling becomes an option again, was the mecca of photographers from all over Europe. It's the Café Greco in Rome, which dates back to 1760. It's one of the oldest um, cafes pretty much anywhere in Europe. And it was a, a bit of a, a kind of cultural circle in which many different artists and um, photographers gathered. So Stendhal was there, Goethe was there, Schopenhauer stopped by to have a cappuccino, uh, Byron stopped by, Keats stopped by, lots of philosophers, music um, composers like Mendelssohn and apparently Casanova also had a sip. So Cafe Greco is this cultural gathering in which early photographs were being discussed, in which, as you can see, of course, a crowd of men would talk about what can be accomplished with photography, this new and exciting medium. And of course, the idea is to preserve, which in a sense plays a bit of a trick in the possibility for Italy to develop its own cultural identity through uh, photography. There was a sense of loss. The idea that the Industrial Revolution and the changing times that pervaded Europe were damaging and tarnishing the heritage, the cultural heritage that, despite it being Italian, felt of European uh, interest. France, Britain, and Germany had a specific historical interest in the study of Italian architecture. You have to remember that the neoclassical period that dominates the 18th century, it's all about neoclassical architecture traveling across Europe. So there were waves and waves of interest for Italy. Also uh, motivated by the discovery of Pompeii and Herculanum in the middle of the 18th century. So it is at this point that Italy starts to find itself um, desired and at the same time subjugated by the desire of foreigners to preserve and manage its heritage and beauty. And even if it's not a matter of managing uh, quite yet, it's a matter of interpretation. One of the most interesting is John Ruskin. I'm sure that's a name you've heard many times before. John Ruskin was a colossal towering figure in the history of British art. And as an art historian, his contribution to the history of art in Italy is substantial. He traveled to Venice, he was so excited to capture the beauty of Venice uh, that he actually owned his own uh, camera to take daguerreotypes. And this is one of the images he took in collaboration with John Hobbes. He worked with a network of, of photographers who could help him create one of his most beautiful books that's entirely dedicated to Venice, which was published just around 1853-54, which to me is incredible how quickly he could actually get these things together at the time. Um, this is the beginning of a sense of um, urgency to catalog Italy before, as John Ruskin put it, hordes of vandals destroy the beauty that remains. There was decay. And of course, the problem with Italy is that there's too much to preserve, even today, to preserve it properly. So photographing 
these beautiful um, architectural remains, archaeological discoveries, became a mission through which to document Italy, its history, but also to which to come to term with the writing of history itself. For the first time in the history of the world, representing these beautiful objects that capture the history of civilization is no longer down to the interpretation of artists. It's a matter of visibility of something that it's considered to be more real, even if it's interpreted to a certain degree. This is one of my favorite photographs from the selection of John Raskin, in which you can actually see this beauty of the architectural uh, building and this very Venetian um, hanging style that you see here. So there is a desire to represent a Venice that belongs to the past and at the same time uh, a, uh, an impossibility to contain a different uh, kind of level of everyday life that photography cannot erase. That's the difference between painting and photography that some found offensive at the time, how photography doesn't embellish, how photography doesn't purge, and instead how it represents seemingly everything in front of our eyes. This is another interesting uh, image by Ruskin in which you can see that the exposure time here must have added up to a decent amount of seconds, probably anything like 15 to 25, in which you can see that the um, Canal Grandes waters are actually uh, very blurry as a result because of the waves and the movement. And there's the ghostly shadow of a uh, ship of some description. It's hard to tell, certainly something bigger than a gondola that was cutting through. This is what photography, early photography, um, helps to capture. And this is the beginning of the first albums, photographic albums of daguerreotypes as well as calotypes that are put together to create portraits of Italian cities. This is the one that was made, one of the many that was made for Milan. And a connection to painting, once again, the ruin. The early aesthetic of photography in Italy is dominated by the painterly tradition of the picturesque. Painterly tradition of the picturesque entails this time and past imbuing everything. It's, it's basically the nightmare, what will become the nightmare, the haunting element of Italian culture haunted by its past and haunted by a past that it's no longer useful, but that seems to stand as a reminder of a greatness that once was. You can see here the work of Panini and the ways in which the images are composed echo what photographers will do. It's the other way around. It's the photographs that echo what uh, the works of Panini, for instance, uh, set as a uh, compositional rhetoric. And of course, the importance of the work of Giovanni Piranesi, the work of Piranesi were popular across Europe and contributed to the construction of uh, Italian identity. So we find early photographs of archaeological and cultural interest replicating those ideas as much as possible, as you can see in these beautiful images. The absence of the human figure is also essential to create the image of a timeless Italy, that it's pretty much contained into a historical dimension that other countries cannot quite grasp. And of course, the natural beauty. Robert McPherson was a Scottish photographer who, as you can see, focused on the idea that Italy is all about the landscape. So this predominance of the Italian landscape that becomes absolutely um, foregrounding and essential to the identity construction that we will see uh, develops throughout the, the, the few decades that follow in the next century. Something interesting about this first lecture and the last lecture in the series is that we begin with a focus on landscape, that it's just natural, that's what it is, that's what happens in the history of Italian photography, to find ourselves again discussing landscape 
as it emerges in the images of Luigi Ghiri and other photographers towards the 70s, the 80s, and then becomes a colossal um, subject in the history of contemporary Italian photography. And um, one last photograph for tonight. It's a beautiful representation of a garden by one of the many, uh, one of the very few and rarest Italian female photographer. This is Jane Martha St. John, who wasn't born in Italy, but spent substantial time in Italy and photographed this beautiful garden in Rome. Believe it or not, even to photography, gender stereotypes applied. And whereas men were invited to document architecture, archeology span and history, women were generally pushed towards the representation of plants, flowers, and uh, nature more in general. On that note, I hope you, I managed to give you a, a general grounding of the essential uh, details in the history of Italian photography, how it emerges and how it is the continuation of this dream that painting had laid bare, this desire to stop time, this desire to capture reality in the most accurate of ways, which then also equates to disposing of the artist and trying to capture the objectivity of photography, which as we will see moving on in the next lectures, is not objective in the slightest. So thank you. Thank you very much, Giovanni. Thank you. It's been a pleasure and always a very enlightening experience listening to you. It changes the way you, uh, you see things. And um, if I may, I will take advantage of my position here to, uh, to ask you a couple of questions. Sure. One is meant, which is, it was uh, interesting how you, uh, you linked photography or the object of the, um, of the early photography and the idea of preservation. Mm -hmm. which you know it's a very it's a very contemporary and uh and present uh concern and uh, sensitivity and it made me think about the very famous and iconic verse by alessandro manzoni in the adelchi dai fori muscosi dagli altri cadenti which of course uh represents this uh, this scene uh, of these people coming out uh, of the decaying uh, forums and Roman temples. Of course, the tragedy was set uh, much earlier than the time that, uh, in which Manzoni was living, but that's probably what, uh, what he had in front of his eyes at that time. Yeah. yeah. And it, <clears throat> of this kind of sensitivity. The other thing I wanted to ask you, I'll put everything together so then you have a free, <laughs> you are free to go wherever you want uh, in your answer. The other thing is that um, you mentioned the um, exposure uh, in terms of, as we talked about, a little bit about the technical mean, medium. Yes. Mental. Uh, but of course, in, in uh, let's say the parameters of photography is also the amount of, uh, of light that you let in and the time. So they already had both of these parameters or uh, let's say the whole was fixed or it was a kind of uh, expanding and closing. And yeah. the last one, as you mentioned, um, the ambassador, the, um, the, pic the painting. Mm -hmm. By Holbein, yeah. Uh, yeah, I had no idea. The, uh, it might have been uh, done with, uh, with the help of the camera obscura. But of course, that painting is very uh, famous because of the anamorphic transformation mm -hmm. of the of the skull, which is also is interesting because if the painting was done with a camera obscura, I doubt the the skull was. And there's also a very strong con, um, con, uh, non, uh, contrast between the extreme realism of the use of the camera obscura and, and the extremely the clearly symbolic yeah. transformation and distortion of the of the skull. That's it. Many interesting ideas and, and uh, uh, opportunities to discuss further, Luca. That's great. Uh, yes, the, uh, I'll, I'll answer your first or comment on your first point last because I think it's the one that's probably more, uh, would be more time consuming. But the, the question with the aperture is interesting in the history of photography because the mobility of the blades, you know, the aperture itself uh, comes and goes depending on the, on the application. So uh, Nieps, devised the camera that had the opportunity to um, regulate the blades so that you could actually minimize the amount of light 
in order to create a sharper image. That's the connection between the amount of light that's allowed to come in through a narrow hole or a wide hole is the crispy quality of the image. Um, with the, with the uh, control of the amount and length, uh, things are complicated to manage at the very beginning. And, and that's why uh, the quality of many images that we have from the first 10 years of photography are hit and miss, you know, it's, it's not easy. And especially Nieps was working without a lens, which then Daguerre brings to the mix, which is really important. Then later on, when photography is popularized by Kodak in the uh, beginning of the last century, uh, the first photographic camera to be um, unleashed onto the world for popular use has no um, flexible aperture. So the, the aperture itself cannot be modulated in any way. And it's basically a shoot and point and point and shoot sort of camera. Um, so it's, it's interesting how to simplify things for the masses at some point, the aperture returns to something simpler, like a pinhole camera, rather than uh, what it had become, which was something more sophisticated already at the time uh, of the gear. And with, uh, um, in relation to the, uh, the second question, I think there is something um, important about the notion of the photograph as something that captures the past in the present. And what becomes complicated with the, uh, with the capturing the, the past in the present is that other countries could actually have an opportunity to capture the present in the present. Because of the history of um, Italy and the abundance of the old among the new, Everyone who took photographs at that time, or let's say most of the photographers who took images at that time, turn around to the old almost spontaneously. There was almost no question that that's what was worth capturing about Italy. And I think that that really adds to the notion of the past glory and decay. One of the things about ruins that's really fascinating that became such a big genre in the history of painting during the 18th century is almost like a manifestation of our growing desire to be part of history. You know, we think of history as this very old thing, but as we all know, it's actually a relatively new um, discipline. And that's part of the challenge. History looks into the past from the standpoint of today. And even the oldest history is not that old. And what I find fascinating is this idea of the ruin emerging during the 18th century and then dominating the language of photography as something that it's ultimately a real manifestation of this desire to connect with a historical past. It's part of an existentialist journey of awareness that we go through during the history of civilization. The awareness that we are not just here today, but that, that the past that came before us makes us who we are today becomes very present, very um, uh, important at that point. And I think photography is the, the best invention and also the most likely invention to happen at that time, just thereafter, that idea of history becoming so important because it is connected not just to the technological in, uh, innovations that lead to the invention of photography, but it's connected to this really strong desire to um, own history and to be able to preserve it and to look at it and to make sense of it. That's how photography really becomes interesting. And Italy is caught in this sort of double-edged sword. It's like prized possession and yet this constant reassessment that what was great about Italy is its past. It's what traps Italy into that identity construct that then we're going to explore further. There was another question there, Luca, wasn't there? I was asking? Yeah, wasn't there a third question? It was about the, um, the anamorphic transformation. Anamorphic, of course, Holbein, yes. Um, <laughs> jury's out. You know, jury's out on anyone who's used the camera obscura. Uh, but it is claimed that the, the uh, Holbein's ambassadors is done with the camera obscura because of the perfection of every single object. It's so intricate. 
uh, and so accurate. The structure of everything is so precisely accurate in terms of how it, it kind of um, respects the, the geometric rules of space that it seems impossible that he, he made it freehand. This skull may have been painted using another device, which is called the Camera Lucida. Now, the Camera Lucida is a projection device that involves the use of a pris prism. And it's a, it's a prism through which you shine light and place the object right in front of the prism. And the prism casts a projection onto the um, sheet of paper that you were drawing upon. And you can tilt that sheet of paper to deform or distort the subject. And then all he had to do was to place it in perspective and, and add it to what he had already painted. What's interesting for everyone who's not familiar with the Holbein painting, um, the ambassadors, when you can travel, travel to London, to the National Gallery, that's where the painting is. And when you push your face to the right hand side of the painting, right against the wall, and you look down, the, paint, the, the skull looks three dimensional in its intended form, which is outstanding. It was um, one of the best special effects ever seen, I'm sure, uh, in the history of art until that point. That's what happens when you don't have TV. See? <laughs> you have to... Yes, you come up with incredible things that uh, are remembered for posterity. Like the first uh, hipster photo. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Uh, just before we conclude and then we we'll let you go, uh, mm -hmm. Ginny is asking, did the invention of the camera affect how artists, uh, definition, the artist's definition of what art was? It caused a massive um, controversy that's still with us today. I'm sure you're all, um, you've all come across somebody at some point who claims that photography is not an art form or that photography is not as much an art form as painting is. And I think that that's uh, part of the um, problematic root of photography. There were two things that played against photography greatly in its challenge to be recognized as a true art form. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they were the presumed objectivity, the, 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 the sort of reduction of labor, the idea that a painting would take uh, months or days to, to create in order to capture the purest form of realism and that photography could capture what it captured at the click of a shutter really annoyed artists and it diminished its um, idiom, it diminished its unique capabilities of doing something that painting couldn't do. That was the beauty of photography. It's like they don't have to compete. They do different things. But at the time, it wasn't just Italy that was dealing with an identity crisis. Photography was dealing with an identity crisis too because it germinated from <clears throat> a history of painting and drawing. And as such, it seemed to be rooted in that history. And it almost by default reverted to the tropes of painting as a way to define its aesthetic essence, which then becomes a trap. Throughout the history of photography in the 19th century, this idea that photography can do mostly what painting can do, but badly, is the ghost that haunts photography. And we also have to remember that the daguerreotypes are very small and Canvases could be like huge, you know, at that point, canvases that were like 20 feet long had been painted. Um, color was another limitation. So at this time, the daguerreotype during between the um, 1839 and like the 1850s is mostly black and white and it could be hand tinted with watercolor but it still looked washed out. So color and size remain the domain of painting. Photography seems to be doubling in these smaller black and white reproductions that nonetheless baffle people because they're so realistic and so present. But the question of is photography art will torture artists and photographers throughout the 19th century. But you can also argue that without the invention of photography, we would have never had Impressionism. Impressionism, in a sense, it's the response to photography. 
artists who want to shift away from what photography can do because color photography was invented in 1861. And when color photography was invented, then the, the, the distance between photography and painting seemed to be so narrow to some that they thought, some artists thought, we will never be needed again. And of course that is not true, but you can look at Impressionism, post-impressionism, cubism, futurism, and then again, the uh, emergence of abstract art. If not solely, it would be wrong to look at these movements and these changes in art as uh, exclusively motivated by photography. But you can certainly argue <clears throat> that without the invention of photography, painting would have probably had a much easier ride. And it wouldn't be the complicated, uh, and positively tortured medium that it is today. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was uh, very interesting to, uh, to listen to you. Um, thank everyone for attending. I hope to see you all again for our second um, lecture on uh, about photography in Italy on March 18. It's again a Thursday at 6 p.m. It will be about truth and fiction constructing identities in the second half of the 19th century. So I think everyone is looking forward to that as I am and um, have a good time. In the meanwhile, stay safe and, uh, and healthy. Thank you, Giovanni, again. Thank you good again. Night. Thank you, Luca. Have a nice evening, everybody. Good night.